Hi there, I'm Scott Lowe with Asheville Tech Media, and thank you for joining us for this Spotlight Series segment. I'm joined today by Steve Preston, who is the SVP for Strategy and Growth at TrapX. Steve, thank you for joining us. Hey, Scott. Thank you. Nice to meet you. And hello, everyone yeah, out there. Great to have you here. Um, you guys do some interesting things around um, security, something we don't see a lot of out there. Um, and can you go to give us an overview of, of TrapX, what you do, and what your role in the company is? Um, yeah. Um, so quick on my role, uh, strategy and growth means that um, it's a combination of obviously marketing, but also business development partnerships and strategy for the company. So it's a pretty cool mm -hmm. role. Busy. Lots of stuff to do. Um, but I get to focus on solutions and uh, the technology as well as go to market. Um, our our TrapX is different, right? So I think um, I think you you nailed it a bit when you said we do things a little differently. I, I'd call it uh, uh, an unconventional security control, basically. Um, uh, it's called deception, right? And many of you have heard of it. You might snap to honeypots and think that think that's what it is, but it is it's a little different than that. We've um, we've discovered a way to make uh, deception or honeypots really scalable and uh, very agile, um, so we can deploy uh, fake things out on the network. It could be it could be a server, right? It could be a router or switch, it could be a printer, it could be a thermostat, it could be a forklift, it could be a blood gas analyzer, it could be a machine controller, it could be anything because we don't touch stuff, we emulate them. Um, and we do it in a really lightweight way so we can deploy hundreds of them. So our customers actually uh, hide their assets in, in a crowd, basically. And the end result is we slow the attack, right? So the attacker spends time um, playing with fake assets instead of real ones. And when when someone touches one of these things, it's real, it's an incident, it's not a false positive. You don't have to spend triaging, you don't have to look for indicators of risk or compromise. It's someone messing with an asset, it's very clear, it's high fidelity and then they can respond really quickly. Yeah, and imagine that it's not part of the fleet of whatever it is that you're, the, have they, the company has under management. Um, that any touch would be, you know, a, a positive. Um, how are you luring attackers to the emulated resources rather than the real ones? Are you doing something where there's almost like a, a part of the emulation, you're leaving something vulnerable so that it looks enticing to an attacker? How's that working? Yeah, let me let me give you, there, there are like three, like three tiers of a, types of deception, right? So one is um, kind of, people are used to talking about honeypots, right? So, and they become more modern, but they're still, at the end of the day, they're still honeypots, right? It's still a full stack of something, right? So let's say it's a uh, customer services website. Uh, I recall one that got compromised a few years ago, right? You'd create you'd create the, the whole stack, right? The OS, the database, the web server, the whole nine yards, and you would allow um, you would allow the attacker to tinker with it all they wanted to, and you learn about their techniques, right? Um, those are built for learning. That goes way back years and years ago, right? And they're valuable. You get great insight from them, but they're heavy, right? They're complex and they take resources. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain the OS. You have to, you know, have to build it and make it authentic. The other side of the coin would be uh, bait, right? And that would be fake files, fake credentials, and that sort of thing to misdirect the attacker. Hey, you know, things like hidden credentials. If someone, if someone compromised my laptop for whatever way, say phishing, right? And they got into my account and they establish a foothold, they would look for credentials maybe to get to my VPN or something like that, right? Um, lures would give you fake things to go after, fake traffic, fake credentials, fake browser history. Those are really scalable and they're lightweight, but they don't provide a lot of insight, right? So if you're left with the two of those, you've got these weird trade-offs, right? You do you go deep insight, limited scale because of the complexity and the weight, or you do broad scale, limited insight. So. Emulation kind of splits the difference, right? It's uh, it's uh, it provides um, interaction. Think a movie set versus a full city, right? So it's a full interactive experience for the attacker. Very, very authentic, but only deep enough to collect their TTPs, their 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 techniques and so forth, and sound alert. And that's like what I said. What you get is insight at scale, 
but you'd really deploy it in a mixed environment because there are there are applications for uh, full full OS traps which we support, right? Things like ransomware, you you would want them to to stay on that. But that's more the exception than the norm, right? You would you would deploy broadly with this emulation, and then you're right, lures would direct traffic to those to those emulated traps. And so if you had, so we just launched a product called Flex, which is for remote workers, where we have a VPN trap in the wild and a cloud trap in the wild versus, and also these enterprise traps. We, we put these lures on the endpoint to direct to the VPN or to the cloud trap, right? And so we, so we kind of extend out to the endpoint, even though we're not an endpoint solution, we'll give you visibility into what's happening from the serial number and MAC address of the laptop all the way back to corporate, right? So yeah, it's 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 lures and traps, right? So you create this environment that's really realistic, simulate traffic and stuff that make that thing uh, more attractive. And you play the numbers game, right? Yeah. So you're basically limiting the number of uh, your exposure. They're not attacking the real thing. You cut it in half, you've cut your risk down considerably, right? Because they're your your frequency goes down by fifty percent um, if you're if you're measuring risk. So it seems like there's that direct risk reduction that you're going to get because they're going to interact with fake assets, which is good yeah. or emulated assets. Um, and there's a there's a it sounds like you're gathering a lot, as you said the lots of learning data. That what would you do with that data? Is that something where it's going to require a human to sort of analyze and then go understand what the attackers were doing and try to design around those risks. Or is there an is there a sort of a machine learning type element that would that would sort of automate some, what it's seen? But how does that work? What's 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 the actionable mm-hmm. about the data that we generated? Yeah, that's, good. that's a good one. So it um, <clears throat> we call them high fidelity. Our customers say we even have customers say they they actually this is one of the tools they use with board meetings because it's like I said if 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 it's a if it's a trapex alert, it's an incident, right? And so we capture the location, who they are, and their techniques, what they're doing, right? And what a lot of customers will do, they'll use that as the tip of the spear, basically, as the, in spearhead and collect context like SIM context and UEBA context around that. So you're not sorting through all those all those alerts that a SIM might throw off, and it and you don't really mm-hmm. it doesn't have to learn necessarily. But this will pull that other data. So what what happens a lot is they'll they'll use this as the early warning and then wrap context with SIM, for example, or D, uh, you know domain data like DNS data to to so you can pivot around that and get more context. And then we're actually tagged back to MITRE, so you can get even more context of what that what what the uh, who the actor might be and that sort of thing. So usually the way it's done is put in a sock is we're the leader, you know, and then we pull, we pull more context. And what that ends up doing shortens response times, eliminates false positives, you know, and that sort of thing. So you're running a more efficient sock. Got it. And I can definitely, obviously any alerting tool, I mean, whether it's infrastructure or the security, false positives are worse than no positives in some cases, because you're wasting yeah. resources. So it sounds yeah. like you're able to mm-hmm help organizations be a lot more efficient in their security response in a lot of different ways, yeah. which is which is great. What's interesting about this, we play really well in um, healthcare, manufacturing, that sort of thing. And it's because of this emulation that doesn't touch anything. So you pick a, a controller, right? And, um, you know, or, you know, something with, with firmware on it. There's no, like, there's no security on that app and and there's very little ability or tolerance to actually put any kind of security control on that platform right and it could be because of concern over downtime or it could be like you know not not um even tenable like you know tenable no no pun intended but it might not be allowed via regulatory regulations in healthcare right so you can't touch them but you can emulate them and so what happens is these are like passive things. So attacks come out of the woodwork, right? Just like just like any asset, right? You put a you put a vulnerable laptop on the network and it gets attacked, right? So so if you're looking at that, the attacks come to it. So it's like a passive sensor, and that's where manufacturing companies get this visibility, and they find all kinds of things in their in their network, even if it's air gapped. It can come in from a from a 
service tech with USB stick. I mean, it, it you know, it, it, it gets on the network. And when I said blood gas analyzer, I meant it. So hospitals do see malware coming from these devices that are vulnerable, right? And you would have no other way to protect them if you didn't have this kind of technology, because sometimes you can't collect logs and you can't put endpoint uh, protection on them. Right. And if they're vulnerable, yeah. uh, we can protect it by directing the attack away from it and giving you visibility so you can contain it on that on that fake asset. So, so would you say healthcare and manufacturing are two of your bigger customers? What what about are there other are there other verticals where you play pretty heavily? Um, we play in tech. We play we, we play everywhere. I just I mentioned those because they're not the usual like banks, retail, like, we, you know, we're in all of those. Right. But what's right. interesting and in, like go find go find an is, industry that doesn't have an IOT initiative. So right. you, you think about okay. banks, of course, and you think about the data center, but there are all kinds of things going on with people using their mobile phones to access their ATM. And we all know that ATMs are vulnerable and that sort of thing. So so you look you look out anywhere across just about every industry and it's hard not to find IOT, right? It's not hard to find certainly not hard to find OT in manufacturing, but so I'd say it's pretty broad, but um, like I said, it's it's uh, it's almost a natural for for healthcare, manufacturing, consumer packaged goods, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you released a product recently that's intended to support work from home initiatives. Were you seeing? Yeah. I assume you're probably seeing um, a market need around, and we've seen in our own research that there's there's significant security concerns for two reasons. One obviously you're you're extending the network to places it was never intended to be extended and two um uncertainty and chaos a little bit create a, a perfect storm for people to and a change in routine a perfect storm for people to do things that they may not have otherwise fallen victim to what were some of your your pressure points that you were pushing to try to you were seeing to, that resulted in the release of the new, the new solution yeah you, you you're almost like you it's like you read my script because those are those are the things we're seeing right is you know um one CISO told me he said i've got call center reps you know working they used to be in a you know on campus on a call center now accessing pii from their homes and it's terrifying right right so it's a combination it's obviously you know people who have always commuted to work and always worked in corporate now working from home, uh, they're distracted, they're alone, um, they're putting more digital information about themselves than they ever did before because they're working from home and they're shopping from home and all that stuff, right? So simultaneously, right. you're giving more, more context for the attackers to use for phishing, and you're also more distracted, more vulnerable. And, you know, we all know that the endpoint could be locked down and you have visibility when it's connected to the network. But what what happens when it isn't connected to the network? Right. What, what about phishing? So there's so many, you know, you should have obviously secure endpoints, but that doesn't you know, you can't say done and dusted. Right. You're still there's still a right. lot of risk. So so the biggest issue we found that we could help with was visibility. So regardless of whether the endpoints connected to the network or not we could we think we we, we kind of reimagine what we could do and it's usually usually uh deceptions behind the firewall right and it's all about lateral movement visibility and if the attacker gets in and they get initial like they they, they get into the network we'll we'll expose those that's we're always kind of in the network um and this forced us to think outside of that and what happens in the cloud like how can you create a cloud trap right without you right. know blowing the sock up with every alert and you know in the world that attacks the cloud how do you how do you create create a vpn trap so we figured out a way to do that um and so now we can see we basically give you a safety net so if and you're right we kind of we kind of take advantage of the chaos i don't know if that's a really the right term to use but everything's crazy attackers are fishing we give them something to fish with you know we give them something to go after it's just false right and that'll right. that'll give security a way to alert that and, and contain it, so they could block them out and lock them out of the VPN and keep them out of the network and deal with the endpoint, right? So that's the Got way it. we saw it, and and um, you know, it's been interesting that we've gotten interest in uh, lots of different places like uh, K through twelve universities, so things that you wouldn't you know normally think of security, but it's where remote workers are. It's a perfect use case, right? You've got 
teachers with their Chromebooks working remotely, they're not used to it, they're doing remote classes, and ransomware suddenly becomes valuable because if you can shut down a school, you know, um, that there's, you can monetize that if you're an attacker. So yeah, it's been a really interesting use case. We just launched it uh, a couple of months ago and already we're getting quite a bit of traction. That's great. I mean, it's, it's good that there's a, something out there because obviously, um, and again, with our research, we're seeing a, a significant increase in at least attempts. Um, I don't know about the success rate, but it's it's uh, it's good to see that there's some some somebody trying to block their way. So, um, yeah, thank yeah. you for the discussion. Um, if yeah. people want to learn more about Cadrex, where can they go? Uh, just go to our website, go to, um, uh, www.trapx.com. Uh, we have, uh, we have a product page, obviously deception grid is our enterprise product. Flex is TrapX flex, uh, remote work, work is the kind of purpose built for, uh, kind of that particular use case. And then you can expand out to, to a broader deployment of, uh, deception if you want. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Steve, for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for watching this Spotlight Series segment. And we look forward to seeing more of you.